So I'd like to welcome everyone to another glorious edition of the Science and Cooking Public um, Lecture Series. And as is tradition in this series, we start by thanking our many sponsors who made um, this event possible. So the sponsors include Jose Andres' Think Food Group and the Alicia Foundation, who provided both financial and intellectual support, um, Whole Foods, um, who, as we say every week, but I'll say again and I'll show you some of the fruits of their labors, has done a remarkable thing, which is to donate all of the food associated with the laboratory component of this course. Um, Harvard University um, Office of the Senior Vice Provost, um, Cole Palmer, um, Le Creuset, um, Mars and Asade Business School all have provided support for this, and we um, are very grateful to them um, for allowing to make this possible. So, okay, so as is usually tradition, before um, listening to Wiley, you unfortunately have to spend 10 minutes listening to me. Um, this is um, um, just so the contrast is perfectly clear. Um, <laughs> More similarities? No, no, there, there will be contrast, you will see. So, but, <laughs> but we're going to start by, um, by showing you some of the creations that the students in this class have made in the laboratory, because we didn't show any last week, so we have a little bit of catching up to do. So um, two weeks ago, the laboratory was on spherification, and one of the student groups made this. I have no idea what it is. <laughs> Another student group, I think inspired by Jose Andres, made an egg, which is made out of mango and cheese. This is spherified. So this week, the lab was inspired by WD-50 and Wiley Dufresne. Oops. Um, and and um, the topic for the week is um, transglutaminase, um, which we will, I will try to explain to you what it is before he shows you the magic that they can do with it. And it turns out that our class, that is the course staff for this class, at least some lucky subset of the course staff, um, before the semester started, had a field trip to WD-50. There's Wiley. There's some of the course staff. There's somebody else at WD-50. Um, in which... <laughs> Who is that? That's John. That's John. Chef de Cuisine. Chef de Cuisine. Sorry. Um, I didn't go. You see, I didn't get to go. I don't get to do anything fun, actually, in this class. <laughs> um, so, um, so the, um, but, but what they taught um, us how to do was to make shrimp noodles. And in fact, the laboratory for this week, this is, these are actual pictures from the students. This is hot off the presses. Um, these are um, ca caramels, which went with the caramelization and the Maillard reaction from last week. And these are shrimp noodles, a la Wiley Dufresne. And he'll show you how to make them in a little while, but the students, it's, it's simple enough that the students made them in the lab. Actually, we had 300 students, Naveen will tell you, who made shrimp noodles this week. So that's pretty awesome. We should clap for that. And, and I should say that, that Whole, Foods, Whole Foods donated 40 pounds of shrimp to make this possible. Pretty good. Clap for that. Do a lot of clapping. Okay. So now on to the more boring things. So this is, this is similar to the one that I showed last week, and I'll just go through it again. So the theme of the week is complex chemical changes. And last week, um, we talked about one set of complex chemical changes, namely caramelization and the Maillard reaction. And today we're going to talk about, today is going to focus on the idea that complex chemistry can be used to really make new foods. And you will see this with transglutaminase. Um, so, um, and we have an equation of the week, and we have various things. But I want to start, actually, um, we'll get to that in a minute. I want to start with something which sort of goes a little bit back to last week, but I think it's sort of any class or lecture series in science and cooking would be remiss without mentioning, which is the remarkable book by Savaron called The Physiology of Taste that was published in um, 1826. And taste is particularly important because, of course, we eat, we eat, what, we, we eat what we cook. We eat what we cook? <laughs> We eat what we Hopefully cook. Hopefully you eat what you cook, yeah. Well, if it tastes good. If, we taste good it eat, if it tastes good, we eat what we cook. And this guy wrote a whole book on the physiology of taste. And one of the problems that we, the course staff, have had with the topic of complex chemistry, chemical reactions is that we don't really understand them very well. And so we didn't have a lot to say about them. And so we started reading this book from 1826, which was sort of interesting. And I just want to share a little of it with you because I think it's so amusing. So um, at the beginning of this book, which, by the way, you can find online for free, you just have to Google it and you'll find it. Um, so you can sit home tonight and read it. He has what he calls aphorisms of the professor to serve the prolegoma to his work. And there are several of these I want to read to you. One is he says, the universe would be nothing were it not for life and all lives must be fed. Another of which is, tell me what kind of food you eat and I will tell you what kind of man you are. Another is, and I think this is particularly appropriate for tonight, the discovery of a new dish confers more happiness on humanity than the discovery of a new star.
Within the gen ed program at Harvard, this is particularly important because as it turns out, there have been lots of classes on stars. But until this semester, there's never been classes about new dishes. So this is, we're particularly pleased about this. And let me just tell you one more, which I don't know. A dessert without cheese is like a beautiful woman who has lost an eye. <laughs> Anyway, he goes on. It's a fascinating read. I recommend it to you all. Um, so modern flavor science is much more boring than this. It sort of deals with the chemicals that lead to flavor. And there are lots of chemicals. And we sort of in the class talked about the chemicals. And we talked about the fact that the flavor depends on how much chemical you have. And the chemicals have these names that I can't pronounce, like ethyl, methyl, pyrozanine, and things like this. And what's interesting about these chemicals is that you can't go to the grocery store and buy them. I mean, it's not like salt. You can just go and buy salt. You can't go buy ethyl, I don't think you can, pyrozine, whatever that is. You have to produce them. You, you have to produce them by cooking. And so, um, and this actually happens through complex chemical reactions, namely the Maillard reactions. There are various chemicals that are produced that give food their taste. And the question that we sort of asked ourselves, and this is going to relate to transglutaminase in a very important way in a moment, um, is, you know, how do I intellectualize the production of flavor? How do I intellectualize the production of taste? And we sort of came to the following view, and I don't know if it's exactly right, but it's at least a view, which is that, you know, so there are these flavor compounds that Savarin didn't know about, um, but if you want something to taste good, you need the right combination of them, and they're all produced at different rates um, and at different times when you're cooking, depending on the temperature that you're at. And so if you want to cook something like Wiley um, and you want it to taste good, what you really need to know about is how to generate the right amount of flavor cook compounds as a function of time when you're cooking to give the right taste. And that's really the magic. Uh, as, I mean, it's why someone like myself will never have hope to cook. Um, now, um, now, what's interesting about this is that in this lecture series, as you all may have realized up until this point, we've been emphasizing up until now critical temperatures. Like we've said, bo water boils at 100 degrees. We've said protein, you know, what did we say? Of albumin, the, pro the major protein in egg, um, denatures at whatever it is, 60 something degrees, whatever the number was. And we've been talking about these critical temperatures. And you might imagine that producing flavor is similar to, you know, cooking an egg. That is, there's a critical temperature above which which you actually, you know, produce the flavor that you want. But what's interesting about flavor production, and this is also true about transglutaminase that we will see in a minute, is that they, there isn't a critical temperature above which it works and a below which it doesn't work. Instead, it's a very gradual thing. Um, and so, um, so if you want to produce, so it's sort of that as you increase the temperature, you start increasing more of the rate of production of a flavor compound. And when you wait longer, you produce more of the flavor. So the physics of this was understood by a man named Arrhenius. And this is an equation, so I'd all like you to clap. <laughs> so um, this actually, this is a very important equation in physical chemistry that expresses that rates depend on temperature in, a, in an important way. And I don't want to belabor it, because you guys don't want to hear this. But I do want to plot this formula for you. This is a plot of the rate of production of something as a function of temperature. And imagine that a flavor compound basically started being produced at around 150 degrees. That was its critical temperature that was given. Well, you see, you're actually producing a lot of it. You know, the rate of it is only is about a tenth down here, and it's about 0.3 here. So it's, there's only a threefold difference in rate, but you're still producing it over a wide range. It's not like all of a sudden the flavor turns on. It's that it's sort of a gradual thing. And this is what you have to control when you're cooking, the sort of gradual part of this. So. Um, if there are lots of flavor compounds being produced, you have to control their relative amounts. And that's a hard thing. OK, so now on to transglutaminase. I have one minute left. Um, so transglutaminase, let's forget about flavor. It's not a flavor. Transglutaminase is an enzyme. And what it does is it binds proteins together. So it takes proteins that already exist in a product and it binds it together. It's a naturally occurring enzyme. It's one that exists in us. The version that is used um, in cooking is, was produced um, by a company, was discovered by a company, it's produced by a type of soil bacteria. And what's amazing about this enzyme is it produces a covalent crosslink between two amino acids, glutamine and lysine. So if you would like your proteins to bind well together, you should find proteins that are rich in glutamine and lysine. And the crosslink is covalent. And for those of you who have been coming to this lecture series the whole time, what you will remember is that covalent crosslinks are very special because they're very, 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 very strong. They're very hard to break. You can't break them by heating. So when you glue meat together with this stuff, then it really binds strongly. And we will see this. Um, Transglutaminase also has the feature that it doesn't, the rate at which it binds things is not 
you know, it doesn't happen at a critical temperature. It sort of turns on slowly. There's a critical temperature, which is somewhere around 50 degrees Celsius, 55 degrees Celsius, at which the rate really becomes effective. Um, um, it, but there is some binding at lower temperatures. So if you read recipes, you can see it takes four hours to get this stuff to work in a refrigerator, but only five to 20 minutes at 50 to 58 degrees C. But one of the things that's interesting, and this is the last thing I will say before turning it over, is that transglutaminase is a protein. And for those of you who have been coming religiously to these lectures, you will remember that um, something special happens to proteins when you heat them up enough. Did anyone remember? They denature. They denature, thank you. They unfold. And when they unfold, they no longer work. They no longer do the job that they were set out to do, which in this case is binding two amino acids together. And so, and there was an equation of the week that we had, for those of you who really are detailed, right? This was several weeks ago, in which we explained the physics of this. And this equation can be applied to transglutaminase, where the critical temperature for, for denaturation is somewhere around 60 degrees. So what this plot really looks like is this. You can heat the stuff up to some amount, and Wiley knows exactly what this amount is. And at that point, and the rate of it works goes up, and at that point, the whole thing doesn't work anymore. And so it's a very delicate thing. <laughs> is that not true? He'll tell us it's not true. It's okay. I'm just telling you what I think. <laughs> He'll tell you what's true. So okay, with that, that's all I had to say. I only embarrassed myself once. Um, I'd like to introduce Wiley Dufresne, who's come from New York City, who's going to tell us about the magic of meat glue. Uh, hi, guys. Hello, everyone. One and all, thank you uh, for coming out on this uh, lovely day. <laughs> Certainly appreciate it. Um, it was hailing when I got on the train and pouring when I got off this morning. but. Uh, very happy to be here. Many, many thanks again t to all of you. Uh, and thank you to Professor Brenner and, and everybody that's been involved in the project, John and Amy and everyone else uh, that has, has been helping us and we've been working with. We've had a lot of fun uh, working with the students, professors, and everybody. Uh, thanks to John McCarthy, who came with me, who's, who's the uh, sole member of the research and development team at WD50, uh, and a, a delta force of one. Um, <laughs> thank you for, for all your work that you have done and continue to do on our behalf. Um, anyway, uh, I, I, I would like to briefly talk about WD50. WD50 is, 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 is my restaurant in Manhattan. We're located on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. and. Uh, the, the original idea in opening WD-50 was to create a place where uh, I could continue my culinary education, where I could, keep, I could keep learning. I went to cooking school. I went to a very good cooking school. I worked for some great chefs. Uh, I had the opportunity to learn a lot. Uh, I, I became a very proficient cook. I understood how to roast a chicken and, and, and fillet a fish and uh, cook a roast. And, boil an egg and do all these things, but I, I, I got to a point where uh, I, didn't, I didn't know exactly why I was doing it. The answer inevitably was, well, that's, that's the way we've always done it, or because I told you so, um, or because it works that way. And, and I think for a young cook, some of those explanations are actually sufficient, but as I got older, it became uh, insufficient, and I wanted to know more. And so one of my primary goals in opening WD-50 was uh, creating a place where I could continue my culinary education. Would you press, press the, the first button there? Thank you. And um, not only myself, but my staff could continue their culinary education. And ultimately, the diners, if they so chose, could continue their culinary education. It was about creating a place that we could uh, begin to learn more about food, uh, to learn more about what's happening to food. Cooking is obviously about manipulating food, and we are putting food through all sorts of thermal changes, physical changes. So it became clear that cooking is about uh, certainly some physics, some biology, but a lot of chemistry. And it turns out that the average cook knows nothing about chemistry. And uh, so I, I began to look for answers wherever I could. And uh, it turns out there's a lot of information. There has been a lot of information out there about what happens to food. As you, as you process it in, in the myriad of ways that we do process food every day. And uh, we, we opened up this beautiful, wonderful, horrible Pandora's box of, of information, of like a constant influ flux of information. And that, that's what I love about the restaurant, is that we'll, we'll never 
we, we have this, this goal of continuing our education and it'll never end because we're always going to learn more about cooking. We know more today than we did yesterday and we know more yesterday than we did five years ago and we know more five years ago than we did 20 years ago and about 30 years ago we didn't really know anything. And it's, uh, We've only just begun to understand what's happening to food as we process it as cooks. We've been cooking for a really long time and we are great cooks but we are not terribly uh, uh, learned and, and my hope is that we can become better cooks, we can make better decisions about how to process food uh, as the more we understand it and, and so that in a way leads us to meat glue, uh, AKA, or transglutaminase aka meat glue. Um, I was introduced to meat glue through Heston Blumenthal, a great chef at the Fat Duck and his, his crew probably almost seven years ago uh, and right there you can see the very first dish we ever made with transglutaminase and, and Heston's uh, crew referred to it as meat glue and I think that meat glue is a much better name than transglutaminase. Uh, <laughs> I think not only is it kind of creepy sounding but it, it also really helps to inform one's thinking about where to go with it because once you start to think about well I can glue meat, what, wait a minute, what does that mean? It opens up a really sort of again a wonderful approach to, to cooking and, and it turns out that you can take you can restructure you know, muscles in interesting ways now we've often been been accused of things like playing God and doing weird things and I'm not you know I'm not making a medieval beast I'm not you know you don't cut it open and sparrows don't fly out of it or anything like that although I think that would be awesome uh, <laughs> I haven't quite worked that out but I you know the turducken lives on thanks to me <laughs> Um, so, so again, we're, we're, that, that brings us to meat glue. And what, what is meat glue? We talked about it briefly. It, it simply is a glue. And it turns out that it, it's very effective on, uh, on most uh, meat, fish, and poultry. Although there, there are some interesting ones that don't seem to glue very well. We're learning and we were just talking about uh, the fun we could have and how we could learn how we could begin to predict whether or not certain things will or won't uh, be amenable to gluing. But, but we've learned uh, a lot of really interesting things about food. We've, we've actually deepened our understanding of the muscles in any given animal as we've tried to decide how to glue it. We've learned more about anatomy. We, we've, we've, we've gotten, again, we've gotten better at our job because of things like meat glue. We've also had a lot of fun. As you can see here, um, we, we dug this photo up. It's not the best. Uh, shot that we have but it is the very first thing we ever did at the restaurant. It's a rabbit sausage with uh, avocado, mustard and, and apricot and, and that's a little tiny rabbit crown roast in the, in the I've never got to use one of these before. Maybe I'll take advantage of it. That's a little crown roast. <laughs> but but uh, this is kind of neat. Um, can I use this in the kitchen? Um, we, well, I worked for many years for Jean-Georges Von Gericht and a great chef and he um, he, uh, we used to make a sausage and it, it was ostensibly uh, diced rabbit meat, some chicken, a little bit of parsley, uh, some rabbit livers in there and, and the kidneys. And we bound it together with, with raw egg and we wrapped it in plastic and we poached it uh, and, and unmolded it. And, and oftentimes it would hold together when you sliced it, but sometimes it would fray a little bit and sometimes it, it, it would just crumble apart. And, when I first heard of meat glue, I thought, aha, we can solve this problem. We can make a casingless sausage. It's not in a, it's not in a casing, it's just wrapped in plastic. And we can, uh, and, and, and maybe we can solve this problem and we can get, as you can see there, really, really clean, clean sliceable lines. And so, and so the rabbit sausage was born and so was uh, WD-50's relationship with, with meat glue. It has been a wonderful one. Again, I feel like it's allowed us to really learn a lot. It's helped uh, bring some notoriety to the restaurant. It's helped keep, keep the restaurant open through hard, hard times. Uh, I, I have a huge debt of gratitude to the good people at Ajinomoto for their introduction of meat glue. They're also the world's largest manufacturer of uh, uh, MSG, if anyone needs that as well. <laughs> a fine product for another day. Um, uh, but can, can, we, can we go on? Um, so what, what I'd like to do is show you four different dishes at the restaurant using meat glue um, and, and, and how they work and how we work with it and, 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 and the different types of meat glue and then uh, we've got some other things that we've made and we've brought. Uh, this is, uh, was, was also an early 
discovery at the restaurant, making noodles out of shrimp. Meat glue was originally designed as sort of a cost saver. You would have two or three tail pieces of a fish. You could glue them together and ostensibly get a single, a single product. You could glue A to B to C, and suddenly you could create a, 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 a good filet. Well, I, t I took that idea, or we took that idea, and said, well, if you can glue A to B, why can't you glue A to itself? So here we've taken shrimp, and you can see um, Tom is uh, probably standing on a phone book. I, sh I hate to make fun of him. But, uh, he's, he's, got, he's got some raw shrimp here in a, in a food processor. He's added some salt and some cayenne for seasoning. Salt actually helps, uh, helps Miklu find some of those proteins as they sort of mulch up the, the surface. The, the salt helps the Miklu find the proteins. But Tom has, uh, you can see we're not pros at making videos. That says <laughs> shrimp RM. RM is a type of Miklu, sort of the standard workhorse of Miklu. It's just, uh, it's the enzyme with a little bit of maltodextrin and some caseinate which is a protein source to help, to help with, with binding. But Tom, Tom's blended uh, the meat glue and the shrimp, some seasoning, uh, all together. And uh, he's now just, uh, he's, he's blended it to a very, very smooth paste. We're going to put it through this, this tammy just to make it even smoother, to make it resemble a, an actual noodle a bit more. Um, as, as you can see, it's certainly a, a bit of a tedious process. And I'm, I'm sure some of the students have discovered the tedium of it. Uh, but it, it's a pretty neat and, and fun thing once you, once you work it out. And, and here it's just about um, creating a better texture, something more, more noodle-like at the end, because the idea was to create something that had the same texture, the same bounce, the same mouthfeel as a starch-based noodle, but to have it only be made from shrimp. So um, this next step was actually a very happy accident that we, we stumbled across recently. That's shrimp oil. Classically, when you make a mousse, in French cuisine, you would take something like scallops or chicken, puree it very cold, and you would drizzle your fat in the form of cream into the food processor and, and create a really nice light airy emulsion, which is how we made these noodles for many years. And the, the texture just wasn't quite right. And recently, we took it off the menu. Recently, we put it back on the menu. And John, who you saw in that, that photo, the, the group shot, got the order wrong, and he added the oil at the end. Uh, as you can see Tom doing here, and made the noodles. And we're not entirely sure why, but what resulted was a very supple, supple soft, supple, smooth, really pleasant tasting noodle. The texture changed slightly. And uh, again, one of the many happy accidents that happens all the time in the kitchen. The other thing you're going to see now is we're putting this uh, into a pastry bag. It's going to then go into a Japanese noodle maker. We used to make these uh, uh, in the pastry bag. We used to just pipe them out onto sheet trays one strand at a time and then pour warm water over them in order to, 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 to cook them. But we came across this device and it certainly uh, brought us into the modern era of shrimp noodle making. <laughs> um, and you can see there, uh, it, that, that, that should be whisked. It, it looks like it should be whisked a bit more, but at the, the, the sheer force that's going to come out of that, this applied when Tom pushes the shrimp through actually results in a nice emulsified, soft, supple, creamy noodle. So here we are into a water bath right at about 50, 55 degrees Celsius. Um, the ideal temperature for, uh, for Miklu where it's sort of most active right into a bath. And, and, and you can see right there that, that, uh, that the shrimp noodle is born. And we do this every day. Uh, about a thousand grams at a clip, and we, we cut them up. And uh, in, in this case, it's, a, it's a, a play off of a classic spaghetti dish. It's shrimp noodles with tomatoes, basil, and garlic. Um, so it's, it's, it's sort of uh, familiar flavors in an unfamiliar form. Uh, tomatoes, basil, garlic, all old friends, even shrimp, old friends. But we've sort of reimagined the way you interact with them. It's something that we do a lot at the restaurant. We take the familiar and serve it in an unfamiliar way. And then sometimes we'll take the unfamiliar and serve it in a familiar way, um, depending um, on, 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 on what we're going for. You'll see in, in some of the other dishes, we have a beef dish that is uh, so somewhat unfamiliar flavors right here, but uh, presented, I think, in a more traditional way. So uh, that, that la those shrimp noodles were made, again, with RM. Uh, it's called Activa RM. Activa is the brand name, like Kleenex or uh, bounty or something like that, and RM is their, the more or less their workhorse 
of the, uh, of the Miklu lines. There's, I think, five different ones, depending on your application, depending on your needs. In this case, uh, we use one called GS. And it's, uh, again, the enzyme, and it's mixed with maltodextrin. It's got a little bit of fish gelatin added to it and some polyphosphates, which raise the pH of the entire mixture so that the, the enzyme can't, uh, normally if you take RM and, and blend it with water, you make a slurry that you can brush on things, but very quickly that the slurry begins to set. This slurry will last all day long because until you touch the meat, the pH is high enough that, uh, that it stays in, it, it doesn't form a reaction. So it just stays liquid and fluid, which allows us to do large, large formats of meat, fish, whatever, as you'll see here. And what we're doing here is, because it, it takes a high shear to blend it in, um, you, you have to forgive us for the little tape there. That's been corrected. Uh, it's a little embarrassing, I'm sorry. But they came and fixed that the day after we shot the video, unfortunately. <laughs> I pointed out to them how how much the good folks at Harvard would be impressed by our <laughs> painter's tape. But anyway, all we're doing here is pulling the air out because uh, we learned the hard way that it, the slurry has to be well, well blended, well sheared to get into solution, but there's a lot of air at that point. It gets slightly viscous and it's very airy, and if you brush, brush it on right away, those, those air pockets can affect your bond and that it, it, your meat is not uh, apt to stick together as well if there's air. So what we're doing here is just a couple of times putting it in a vacuum chamber and pulling all the air out and you'll see it gets to be sort of a, a clear, almost a light caramel colored uh, solution. Um, and then we're able to work with it all day long, which is very convenient in this case uh, for the beef. Um, I was pleased to learn, the other, you're going to see Tom is going to take a, a Wagyu flap steak, which is from, from the diaphragm area of, of a cow and, and brush it together and make a really nice steak, and, and it's almost exactly like the picture on the Wikipedia page for Miklo I just discovered, which is, which is kind of fun. Um, so here, here we, we have the, uh, this is a, a flap steak that, that we've trimmed of, of some of the fat, not all of it, but we've taken mu much of the silver skin or connective tissue off of it there, and uh, you see Tom's just brushing it, and then he's going to put the two together, and wrap it in plastic, apply a little bit of pressure to it, and as the professor mentioned earlier, time is, is an issue in the, in the bond and allowing it to form. So we, we try to do these the day before we need them, although there, we have you know, had success day of, but it's always nice to do this the day before, and you can really get a nice, nice bond here as we have on this, on this steak. And, uh, it, it's, it's a very effective way of, of taking a, a piece of meat like this, which would normally be very flat. We've done it with skirt steak, flat uh, wagyu flap, l l flat irons, cuts that are kind of flat and hard to cook, medium rare, nicely. Uh, we're, we're able to stack them up. As you can see here, we get a much larger format of meat, which allows us to cook it in a more controlled way, I think, um, which is why I like using meat glue. Again, it's not about playing God or, or fooling around, but it's, it's using ingredients like this to make things better. And not, not that the animal didn't grow right, it's just, it's difficult. It's difficult to cook. Uh-oh. Oh, there it is. Whew. It's difficult to do things other than make fajitas or something like that out of it, where you just cook the meat to death. But now we can, we can cook it nice and, and medium rare and, and do some interesting things. So there you can see that... Um, it's, yeah, I can see the seam, but I don't know that everybody out there would pick the seam out. Um, but you can see we've taken that piece of meat and made a really nice sort of chunk or slab that you can, you can then cook. And, and in this particular instance, that's what we're going to do. We've done. We, we, we actually uh, cook these whole, uh, <coughs> these, these chunks like that. We just sear them in a pan and cook them, cook them slowly. So... Uh, again, I think a very useful and practical application of Miklu, something that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And you can see it served here with, uh, oh, not quite yet. But again, you, you might, you, you know, quick glance, you can see a line, but you really got to look for it. And you really got there you can't see it at all, which is really nice. So here we have a Wagyu flap steak with turnips. This is uh, malted barley, and this is a... Um, uh, parsley and bitters puree, and this is a malt sauce made from uh, a barley malt. 
And uh, what's interesting about this dish is it has miklu everywhere on it. This barley is also made with miklu, which you're, you're going to see right here. Unfortunately, um, our over-enthusiastic AV guy put these out of sequence, and the next two were supposed to be in, in a different order. But I'm going to jump ahead, um, and we're going to talk about, uh, about the barley that's on that dish. Now, miklu, as the professor talked about, works when there's certain proteins present and gelatin happens to have a fantastic relationship with Miklu. Miklu loves gelatin, loves it to death. And so we began to try to see if we could exploit that, if we could introduce gelatin into things that didn't have gelatin, if we could use the Miklu to bind things that didn't have their own protein source. And it turns out that you can. Um, we started with soybeans. Um, and, 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 and pureed soybeans and, and blended miklu and gelatin into it. Um, but here what we've done is we've taken barley, cooked barley with a little bit of barley malt and beef stock, give it a nice amber color, and then you're going to see over there um, Clay's got some gelatin and some miklu, and he's going to put some gelatin in a little bit of water and some miklu in a little bit of water and uh, mix that all together in there. And what's going to happen uh, is that you have to excuse excuse Clay if you look you, let's see if we get a shot if you, if you look closely you can see that he has a tendency to write notes to himself on his hand and <laughs> there there's marker always on poor Clay's hand ever since the day I met him see he's got a note a note not to forget something he should put a note not to write on his hand maybe but um, what what was really startling to us about this was really that it worked. It was just an idea, but it worked. And, and we, these, this thing has formed a network, a, a, a gelling mechanism, and we've just used it to bind this together. And it forms this incredible covalent bond, as, as, as Professor talked about, how strong it is. And it really is. It's bulletproof. Um, the first application was, was just a vegetable puree that we added miklu and gelatin to. Now it's not vegetarian anymore, but we're able to spread soybeans really thinly and hold it up and, and make a sheet of soybean. It was almost like, for those of you who know what yuba is, which is uh, made from dry soybeans, it's a, almost like a tofu skin. We made fresh yuba, and it was really very interesting. And then we took um, uh, quinoa, cooked quinoa, and we bound it the same way as this. And ra rather than put it into a block, which is what Clay is going to do, we spread it paper thin between two sheets of plastic, and we just cut it into weird shapes, and we threw it in the fryer. We thought it was just going to blow apart, and it stayed together like chips. So we had these quinoa chips that were in the fryer, and it was like, oh my God, why, this is nuts. This isn't supposed to work. The fryer is a, a dangerous, violent place, and, the, and the, <laughs> the bond is just sitting there smiling in the fryer. And so really, we just started going nuts, and, and John said, why don't we try binding, binding some barley? So we took barley, which is a favorite grain of the house. Again, we cooked it in some beef stock and some... Uh, uh, amber barley powder used in beer making, uh, added the miklu, added the gelatin, uh, poured it into this mold, and, and al again, allowed it to sit for a period of time. Four to six hours is ideal. I mean, uh, overnight is ideal. Four to six hours is it, it's certainly workable. But, but uh, it makes just this incredible bond that, that, that has an amazing amount of strength to it. And you'll see, this cake, you know, we call it a barley cake. Um, it is incredibly durable and resistant to heat. We put it in the oven in the restaurant to warm it through. We just, we, you'll see Clay just break it up into little pieces. Um, you know, there's the, the note to himself again. Um, and, uh, and, and then put it in the oven to warm it through, and then we'll hit it with a blowtorch. And again, it's just really, it's, it, it always is very striking to me how strong the bond is and how much uh, sort of... Uh, Violence it can withstand. You can really beat that, beat on this bond, and it's amazing to me. And, and and you know we're only beginning to understand it through through the the relationship we've been able to strike up with you guys here about why and how strong that is. But uh, but I think it's I think it's really fascinating and and sort of sky's the limit. I think with this, like I said, we did it with uh, with vegetables. We've done it uh, with, with with soybeans. We did it with. Uh, with quinoa, and here, here it is again with, uh, with barley. I'm trying to think, are there some other things that we've, we've done with it recently? Oh, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that later, actually. That's a good point. So imagine that that was, that was in the oven, a 400-degree oven, for, for five or six minutes to heat up, and then we hit it 
we hit it directly with a torch and even you'll see in a second even like on a very very close up like that where I would expect to see some weeping or some sinuresis or something there's there's really nothing it's just I think it's just really remarkable it, it's not it's not even really bubbling it's like none of the liquid is coming out and it's just really for us it's really exciting because oddly enough we wanted those Maillard flavors we wanted that burnt uh, the sugar and the, and, the, and the barley to caramelize and we wanted that sort of burnt barley flavor and it really worked nicely with the dish and so um, this is sort of a, a Miklu 2.0 and was meant to segue into our Miklu 3.0 but like I said they got uh, I'm sorry they, they're out of sequence um, you're going to see now uh, our fish a fish application a codfish which we do uh, to great to great success in the restaurant all the time Miklu and fish are are very good friends that gets along it seems to work very very well here's a here's a dish of cod with peas and coconut it's a nori flavored pasta and a carrot dashi so our, our codfish comes in and uh, Roxanne is is see she has her notes tattooed to her so <laughs> they don't they don't come off um, she's just going to take the codfish take the skin off and she's going to strip it up uh, remove the bones obviously strip it up and again using that slurry that GS slurry which uh, you can you can sprinkle uh, Miklu onto, onto things or you can make a slurry and uh, we have found generally speaking for us slurries with large formats seem to, to work better there I think I feel like there's maybe a guarantee in surface contact and things like that but uh, there's there's that slurry again that that, that Tom made earlier and now Roxanne's just going to put it all over what looks to be a tremendous amount of cod and, 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 and bring it together really nicely, I think, in, in, in a single. That's, I believe, two, uh, two, two sides of cod, a whole, one whole fish. And she's going to roll that up uh, and, and make a, a real nice, uh, nice roulade. Um, and, and again, we've done this by just sprinkling. You can put it in like a sugar shaker or a, a passoire like you would with uh, pa confectioner's sugar and kind of tamp it over it or a dry pastry brush works really well. Just dip it in the powder and kind of kind of tap it over it and you get you get some good coverage but I feel like with the with the brush and the slurry it, things really uh, really happen well uh, if she only worked that fast really. Uh, no I'm just kidding Roxanne is great and uh, is, is, is really good. She actually has, has nailed this to say the least. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. We do a lot of, we make a lot of tubes in the restaurant. Um, it's good for cooking. Things cook evenly. Uh, it's not, it, again, it's not just to see if we can do it, but it, uh, you find that restaurants, it's a, sh it's a popular shape, I think mostly for, for uniformity. Um, and and, and here's, here's a good shot of, of the cod coming out uh, and, and how she forms it up very nicely. And uh, again, there, there, we've done this with lots of different fish, uh, oily fish, not so oily fish. It, it, it really, um, seafood works particularly well with, with GS. Uh, RM is, is not out of the question. There are other ones. There's, uh, there's uh, a, a Miklu formulated specifically for dairy called YG. It's used for thickening uh, yogurts and things like that. Um, there's an FP, which instead of uh, sodium caseinate has some... Uh, what does it have? Is it, I think it's whey protein, which is mostly for label label declarations. There's TI, which is an, an interesting one. It's 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 the pure enzyme, just with a little bit of maltodextrin, and it comes in a in a, in a brown bag, which I, uh, with with a brown label, which I always thought was funny that the pure stuff comes in a brown bag, but uh, that's uh, maybe a bad drug reference. But um, Anyway, so, so Roxanne is, is now just tightening it up and, and, and getting all the air out of it. Again, letting it sit for four to six hours or, or overnight if applicable. And then you'll see how nicely and cleanly she's able to, to cut this fish and portion it. Uh, in this case, what we do is we take it, we sear it lightly on one side, baste it with a little bit of, uh, bit of butter, and serve it with a puree of uh, freeze-dried peas and coconut milk. Um, carrots cooked in a little bit of dashi, finished with fish sauce. We make a pasta out of uh, uh, regular pasta, but we add nori into it, so it's a nori-flavored pasta. And then we, 
we, we finish it with a dashi that's made from, from carrot juice. It's, an, it's a very Japanese looking and sounding dish, but it's nothing that a self-respecting Japanese person would do. So, um, uh, uh, but, but, I, but I think it, it works very well, and you can again see how, how cleanly and how evenly it, we're able to shape things. You're also able to align the, the, the muscles of the fish all in the same, along the same line, so that when we cut it, we're cutting it through the grain. We're, 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 there's, there's a lot to be said for doing this, for making, uh, in, particularly in a restaurant setting, making, in a way, making food better, which, which I think is an important aspect of this. We're not, we're not changing the spirit of the fish. I can't make the fish taste better, but I can make it cook more evenly. I can make sure that when you slice it, you're always slicing uh, through the grain properly so that you don't have to worry about getting a tough piece. We've taken a little bit of the, the human error or the diner error out of it. All for the better. So that's, that's the dish before the pasta goes on it, and that's the dish once, uh, once the pasta is laid on top. And those, those are some, I think, very, very classic examples. Um, if you want to just, uh, at your leisure, put the, put the slideshow on. We're just, I've got a, a, few, a few more uh, things that we've done recently that I think are interesting applications with meat glue. And these are just about 12 images of dishes at the restaurant over the years that have uh, Miklo in them, and I'm just going to put them up there to take away from my, myself. So uh, there, th this might be, might be hard for you guys to see, but I'll, I'll, bring, it over, I'll bring it over here. Um, so we've, again, we've, we've, we've tried to have some fun with the notion of things that, that uh, don't have their own uh, Gel, don't have enough gelatin in them or, or don't have enough protein or don't have any gelatin to, um, to see if we can introduce that and come up with some, some interesting uh, applications. And some things have been more successful than others, some of which uh, we've, been, we've made a lot of progress on even since we've been fortunate enough to develop a relationship with the good people here at Harvard. We saw today actually um, in, in an embarrassing way how effective and smart college students are because something we've been trying to do for a year and a half they showed me in 15 minutes today, so <laughs> go figure. Um, so these are just some, some I think, interesting applications of, uh, of, of meat glue that, that, that are, are some, some of which are using some of the, 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 the proteins present, but others aren't. This is a, a tofu that we've made. Um, we've, uh, you can see here, that we, I carried this. And I was, I had two of them, one for today and one for tomorrow, and one of them didn't make it. But uh, this is um, tofu that we blended, and obviously when you, once you blend tofu, it, it won't reset on its own. But with the introduction of some meat glue, we were able to get it to reset. So what we've done is we, we took Campari, which is a liqueur, and reduced it considerably and blended it into the tofu. And we now have Campari-flavored tofu, which <laughs> is delicious. Um, we, we've had a lot of difficulty with, with fat systems, getting things that are high in fat to, to set. And again, we're learning as we, our dialogue continues with, with, with you guys here that it, maybe it's the fat, maybe it's other things that aren't, are getting in the way of it, but we're noticing that, that certain high fat um, systems have a hard time gluing. This is, uh, this is foie gras. We've made a terrain of foie gras and blended some meat glue into it because uh, I, I find terrine of foie gras to be delicious. I also find sautéed foie gras to be delicious, but they, they have different textures. One is a terrine and one is a roasted foie, and the textures are different. But the idea was if you could get meat glue into it, could you create the texture of a terrine but have it hot? Because regular foie gras terrine will melt when you heat it. it, it it's been manipulated in such a way that it won't sear the way, uh, seared foie gras sears the way when you take a liver and you slice it and sear it. Once you process it, you can't, you can't then sear it. It melts. But uh, about every third time, we're able to get this to work. And um, what happens is you can make foie gras that won't melt. And much like, much like the, the barley, it's pretty exciting. Now, normally in the restaurant, I would, I would put that in the oven and get it nice and warm all the way through, and then maybe we'd finish it in a pan. And, and, and again, you can see, oh, okay, never mind. You can see, you can see that it, it's taken uh, a direct hit, and, and, and it's still smiling. It's hard to see the smile under there, but it is smiling. 
and again, that's exciting to us because it's opening up a poss new possibilities. Can we, can we serve something that you could never serve hot before? Could we now serve it hot? And what does that mean? And, and where do we go from there? And that's, that's some exciting and interesting things for us to think about. And another idea that, that we're, we're working on uh, is, is, is taking things like chicken stock, which are rich in gelatin, uh, and trying to figure out if we can measure the amounts of gelatin that are in there and therefore know how much meat glue to add to it in order to get uh, a, a chicken stock, which as you all know is our, will gel on its own because it has gelatin. And uh, gelatin is, is sort of the, sort of the, the, it's the, it's the best. It's why we all like Jello because when you put it in your mouth, it's, it, it melts. It melts at body temperature. Has a fantastic melt back. But if you could, what if you could have hot Jello? That would be kind of fun, or, or maybe not. Nobody clapped, so maybe that's weird. <laughs> I thought it would be cool if you could have hot Jello. We have not quite. Again, we're working here with the good folks at Harvard to try to help us understand if if we can have hot Jello. But what we've done in the meantime is we've we've taken. Uh, uh, bouillon cubes, which have chicken delicious, the, all the good parts, the tasty parts of the chicken in them, mixed it with water, reintroduced the gelatin and the meat glue, much the same we did with the barley, and got it to set. And so we have sort of a hot chicken jello, but uh, we'd like to get, be able to make our own chicken stock and get it from there, but we, we don't have that just yet. But again, I think an interesting uh, application and an idea to be explored if during Concord grape season, you could grape Concords and you could then make a Concord grape jelly and serve it hot with, you know, peanut butter ice cream. That would be delicious. You know, you'd have hot and cold, you'd have textures. You're with me now, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, so again, this, you, you're just going to have to take my word for it that this can actually get heated because there's no need for me to do it a second time. Um, some, some other interesting things, again, much, much along the lines of what we did with the, I talked about earlier, we made soybean sheets. Uh, here we've taken peanut butter and we've made a sheet of peanut butter. We've taken peanut butter, we've blended peanut butter uh, with meat glue and gelatin and rolled it between uh, two sheets of plastic. And then once it's cooled down, we've, we've cut it up and made uh, peanut butter spaghetti, which <laughs> we served on a beef dish as a, with a sort of a play on pad thai, where there was beef and peanuts and, and stuff. So that, that's, that's sort of, sort of fun. And then I guess, I guess sort of lastly, um, some, some things that we've just like literally just started to sort, sort out and figure out that I'd, we're very excited to show you guys um, are, are, are this what we're calling fruit or vegetable glues. Uh, and this is by no means perfect, but I, but I think um, pretty, pretty neat. If you can see if you can get a shot of these. Um, we, again, thinking about what, whether or not things have it, it, carrots and celery, they don't have any gelatin in them, obviously, but if we could take gelatin and put it into, if we can impregnate the vegetables with gelatin and then sprinkle them with meat glue and let them sit for a while, then we could have uh, j vegetables that stick together. And I mean, these, <laughs> these stick together. And again, is that weird? Maybe it's weird, but it's also kind of neat. And I mean, it, they, don't, they don't move. I mean, they, <laughs> they, they, I mean, they, they, you know, but they, here, here again is, is, is the same idea with, um, Asian pear and apple. We, we glued the two together. We, we, we put them both in, in solutions of gelatin and then sprinkled them with a little meat glue. And um, they're, they're, they're solid. I mean, they're not, they're not going anywhere. And it's pretty, it's pretty neat. Again, where you go with this, I mean, if, if uh, you have to put cheese on this, right? Isn't that what you said? There has to be cheese on the fruit plate. What was that quote again? I, I, cheese? Yeah. Dessert without cheese, right? So here, here, here again is some ideas. Just you know, fruit terrines, vegetable terrines, classic element of uh, 
of French cooking, and, and we're just sort of walking that idea down the road. What, what, what is the terrain of 2011, 2012 look like? And, and is it this or not? I don't know, but again, this is pretty exciting. You can put this in a pan, you can caramelize it. Uh, caramelized apples, caramelized pears, delicious. Uh, they hold together. Pretty, it's pretty neat. And these are, these are things that, that, that John, has just, John has just figured out in the last couple of weeks, and we wanted to bring here and sort of debut for you guys, and so uh, you know, I don't know if you want to put the the, the images back up there, um, but that that's that's all I have to say about Meek Lou. Um, Meek Lou is is my friend, and uh, <laughs> I'm better for having met her. And uh, I'd, I'd I'd certainly like to open it up to questions and and to say once again thanks to everybody, um, and and that's that's sort of it. So. Okay, so we do have time for questions. There are mics. Are there mics? Does anybody around here have mics? What does it taste like? <laughs> what does, what what does, does it taste like? taste like? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. It has very little taste. There have been some people who claim that they can taste a, a, a slight off taste to it. Um, uh, under, under certain situations, extreme situations, I have eaten more meat glue than any of you ever will. Um, <laughs> And I don't, I don't really detect a taste. Now, I, I can tell you that if you use too much of it, it will change the texture of something. We found on very, very thin pieces of fish, sardines, something like that, that it will begin to, to set the entire filet. We, we, we used to glue sardines together. And by the next day, they, they didn't taste bad, but they, were f they, they tasted, I don't want to say fake, but they didn't have the texture that the sardine had before I put the glue on it. And that was just a function of it sort of penetrating all the way through the tiny, tiny filet. But again, that's not a taste, that's a texture. It has very, it has no detectable flavor that I can, that I can recall. There's a question over there. Hi, what is the difference between meat glue and collagen? Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, one, one is an enzyme and... Meat glue is an enzyme, collagen is, you know, the stuff that holds meat together. Okay. <laughs> What he said. I think that meat glue will work on collagen. Should. It, uh, protein, you know, collagen? Should. Yeah, you know. Should. Um, it should. If it works. Yeah. If there are enough glycine, you know, glycine, glycine and, and glutamine. glutamine. Glycine and glutamine. If I may, firstly, I, I worship at your altar. Uh, with, 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 with that said. I feel said, for you. Thank you. <laughs> With that said, um, more on a medical term, how do you suppose meat glue would work on one's digestive tract when it's actually digested? Uh, I believe that the, uh, the, the pH of your stomach, it breaks most of those enzymes down and, and renders them uh, ineffective, inactive. I don't, I, I don't want to use you, the wrong you, you words at Harvard. You digest covalent bonds all the time. That's all of the energy that you eat that basically lets you run around is covalent bonds. And there are enzymes in your stomach that help you do that. That's what's so great about your stomach. <laughs> is there somebody did you uh, here I'm going to go up here right? um, just a question like with the peanut butter uh, noodles that you were making why use the meat glue as opposed to using a mixture of like gel and gum and agar agar uh, because it was about a texture and I would be very impressed if you could make a noodle out of agar and gel in, which are two different hydrocolloids uh, long chain polysaccharides that would be able to behave with that flexibility and that heat stability. I'm not saying you can't do it, but I'm saying I can't. And that that, that makes a, a, a texture truer to uh, a pasta, a, a farinaceous noodle, uh, better than I've ever been able to do. I, I've had a hard time making heat stable noodles that are pliable, that can be worked in a pan, that can be twisted around a fork, that can behave like pasta with, with uh, hydrocolloids. So, so you could basically use that same substance of the, with the meat glue and make like a ravioli sort of wrap? Uh, you, 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 could, you, could you fold it over something? To get it to stick to itself? Yes. You, you probably would have to take something like a slurry and brush it to get them to stick to each other. Um, we, we haven't, we have a weird noodle obsession at WD-50 and it, it hasn't, 
headed over to raviolis just yet. Um, <laughs> it's mostly extruded pastas for reasons that I don't know. <laughs> The question right here. Yeah, my question is, do you have um, texture issues with it? Like the foie gras that you can hit it with a heat gun like that, um, does it really melt in your mouth the way foie gras should? Um, I, I would be lying if I told you it melts, but I, I believe that we've messed around. When it's right, I think that the texture is pretty impressive. I'm not going to tell you that it's going to melt in your mouth because it's forming a gel that's not, that's thermal irreversible, that doesn't melt. But when it's right, and I told you we get it right probably 35% of the time, um, the other times it just, it just turns to soup in the pan, like regular foie gras terrine does and should. But when it's right, I think it's pretty, uh, I think it's pretty interesting. And I, 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 I mean... I, I can't give you this, I'd say take it home with you, but uh, this, one's, this one's actually like over a week old because I, I, the, the ones we've made since don't, didn't work, and I wanted to make sure that we could bring one for you to see. I don't think that this is at its best. I mean, you know. <laughs> the texture's pretty good. You just have to take my word for it, and someday if we get it right, you'll be able to have it at WD-50. I mean, John's job is contingent upon it being done by New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question over here. Have you done much in gluing different types of meats together, and what considerations have you had to take in that? Gluing not just, you know, pork and beef, but say, you know, something like squid and then something like... Like, uh, like lobster to a chicken yeah. or something yeah. like that? No problem, but lobsters and chickens, they don't cook the same. So when they cook, you, you, how, how are you going to cook your lobster? How are you going to cook your chicken? I mean, they're, they're very different and they behave differently. Uh, it's a muscle, it contracts. How they cook is very different. I can, I can make those two things bulletproof. I can make you a baseball of both of them. <laughs> but I can't promise you that they're going to taste good when, they, when they're cooked together. Like, I, you would say, oh, we'll put it in a bag and cook it slowly. And they, Maybe, maybe it would work. I mean, you see up there, there was an image of, 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 of a ball. That was an entire half of a chicken. With the, with the thigh, the breast kind of rolled up and the thigh rolled around it and then wrapped up. And that's like leg meat and breast meat, which definitely cook differently. And we were able to make something like that work because, again, at the end of the day, it's both chicken. But I, and, and there are certain things. You can take uh, salmon and wrap chicken skin around it. And that's a very thin layer. And, and, and you can do, you can, you can make a medieval beast if you want. <laughs> It's just not going to necessarily cook as well as you might like it to. But I would, I would say go for it, man. Whatever you want to glue, glue. <laughs> Far, I'm the last guy to stop you, you know? If somebody had a gluten allergy, would they be able to eat, say, the shrimp pasta? Um, now, there's conflicting reports on when they're... Uh, they claim that the amount of gluten in that thing in meat glue is fine, but it's often added to, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to read you, that's a, a great question, and I knew that one of you was going to ask that, so I have some information here on, on gluten and meat glue, and, uh, and, and how, how it might, what might happen, um, and it says right here, that, uh, uh, where is it? There seems to be, uh, okay. The main hazard of creating novel proteins is their effect as a potential allergen. While meat glue itself is non-allergenic, there are studies that show that gluten can be made more allergenic if treated with meat glue. So meat glue itself is not, but Gluten, gluten-free cereal products can contain small amounts of gluten. That small amount is below the threshold of activity for celiac patients, people who can't eat gluten. Uh, if that small amount of gluten is made more allergenic by meat glue, there is a possibility that a gluten-free product could suddenly pose a hazard. But this study goes on to say that there are other studies that say that that's not true, but that's often, <laughs> that's often the case with studies. So. Um, I think that's a fair question. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't know I've, if the celiacs want to be part of a control group, but um, <laughs> I, I, I really I don't have much more information than that right there, and I apologize for that. 
So uh, my question is a slightly different question on gluten and uh, meat glue. Have you guys uh, experimented with uh, using it for breads or baking or sort of any uses that it might have with regards to uh, either enhancing the stickiness of bread or, or kind of what effects it has used using it gluten doughs. bread? No, I, I, I know it's used a lot in pastas and breads and doughs, but we've been mostly interested in using it to make bread pastas that, that have no flour in them, but we have not. No, we only make one kind of bread at the restaurant and it's a lavash, it's a flat bread. Um, the philosophy at the restaurant is we don't really want you to eat a lot of bread. We want you to eat the food, so we make a, a very thin, very light bread that's not very... So we, we have no, very little experience with that, I'm sorry. Yo, uh, so I, I noticed that uh, when uh, your chefs are doing a lot of prep, they'd be using their hands. If, for instance, say, um, they're working with this, uh, the meat glue slurry for you know an hour or two, and it's on your hands, it doesn't like... Kind of, because your hands made out of proteins too. It doesn't kind of. <laughs> it doesn't have like have any effect. You wait on till your friends pass out and. Ah, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, those kinds of parlor tricks don't work. But um, there have been cases of people in the restaurant having a little bit of an allergy on their hands. Uh, but we have also speculated that it's the latex in the gloves that people are wearing and. That's why some people wear latex gloves when they work on it, and some people have opted against it because they've had reactions. But I don't, I, again, I, you might ask the professor, I don't believe that, the, that, the, that your hands are, there's any available stuff on your hands that could ca cause an actual bond. Like, you don't have to, you're not going to end up, you know. I'm hiding back. <laughs> I decided to hide back in the corner for that one. And instead, there's a question right here. I was wondering if you've tried using meat glue on milk, because there's a lot of album in the milk, and... Maybe you can make cheese that way. There, there are some really interesting patents for meat glue um, for all sorts of things from cheese making to field dressings for the military, for chocolate, uh, processed cheese, yogurts, all sorts of stuff. And yes, it can be used to thicken, thicken cheeses, thicken yogurts, make cheese. We, uh, again, don't have a, a lot of personal experience in the restaurant, but it, it, you know, they, they do have some particularly formulated for dairy. Their YG is a dairy-specific blend of meat glue, and it, it has a, I mean, if you go to some, somewhere like Free Patents Online and just type in translutaminase and milk or dairy, you just see it's, you could, I, I've gotten lost for days. <laughs> There's a question right there. Yeah. Hi, Chef. I don't know if this works, but has your new friend Meat Glue met your old friend Egg? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's a, fu it's a fair question, and uh, no, but they should get together because <laughs> I'm sure there, there's some interesting things that would come of it. Um, I, that, that was, uh, that's, that's, on a, that's on a scrap piece of paper that's tucked under my desk somewhere trying that, but they, they haven't yet, so if you've got some insights into that, I'd, I'd love to hear it because I'm, I'm sure that there's some interesting things that could happen there, definitely. A couple more questions. So you, you talked a fair bit about how careful you need to be about the different materials that you use and the uniformity of how they, how they cook, but have you thought about using materials that cook really differently to get funky structural stuff like crunchy on the outside, gooey on the inside, or layers of crunch and goo, or, you know, stuff like that. Layers of crunch and goo. <laughs> that sounds like a band. Um, uh, n no, I, no. I, I don't even know what to say to that, but that's, that, I'm not sure what you mean in terms of like different, like, uh, like one fish that would be crunchy on the outside and gooey on the inside or something yeah, like that. Different but layers of different, different kinds of fish or different things all together. I mean, we've just, we've literally just begun to play with layering things like, uh, like vegetables together and how they, how they might behave. Um, 
but no, I, and, and I think that these are great questions because that's, you guys are subtly having the same sort of reaction with Miklu that I've had for years, like, oh, what about this? Or, oh, what about that? And that's what I, that's the whole point. And that's why I think this is such an interesting ingredient because it begins to be quite quickly, sky's the limit. What, what if we add it to an egg? Or how can we make something gooey and crunchy? And I think that these are great questions. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I haven't done everything with Miklu, but I, 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 I think I'm excited by the fact that it's stimulating that kind of thought with you guys because that's, that's what it does to us at the restaurant. We get kind of excited thinking about how we can work with it. So let's do one more question. Um, I don't know if this is on. Oh, yeah. Um, so I apologize if this misses the mark of a, the point of a meat glue lecture, but given the pervasive use of gelatins in a lot of the traditionally vegetarian dishes, do you guys accommodate for vegetarians at WD-50, and how do you kind of reconcile that? Um, yeah, of course we accommodate for vegetarians. Yeah, we're all allowed to make bad mistakes, you know. I mean, <laughs> I'll, I, there's a lot worse, sort of more complicated, I should say, worse. That's, I didn't mean it like that. There are a lot more complicated dietary restrictions that we deal with. Uh, but vegetarians, absolutely, absolutely. Even though it has, uh, you know, gelatin all over the place. With meat glue is... Vegetarian. Oh no, I mean like it comes in, in from all of the in all of the examples that you use, or in most of them, the slurries kind I of. I can't make a miklu tasting for you that's vegetarian, but I, I mean I can I can serve you vegetarian food at WD50, but I have not we have not really investigated making using miklu to make vegetarian options. Gotcha. That yeah, that has okay. not been uh, probably nor it will ever be a priority. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a vegetarian. I was just. Asking. <laughs> Then shut up. <laughs> so, so I think that's a great note upon which to thank Wyland.